Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Snapshot, episode 65. I'm Brendan Patrick, joined always by Marvel Snap Phenom, Cam Best. Cam, you're weak in Marvel Snap, sir. Ah, uh, pretty solid week in Marvel Snap, I gotta say. After I took a bunch of time off last week, I've just been, like, sitting or hovering around 100 or so. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's been pretty fun for me because what seems to be happening is like now that I'm not like Omega trying to climb the game is like, no, you got to climb, dude. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. So I I went on like, you know, I had like a 13 and four streak with discard. I had like a 20 and three streak with destroy. And it's just like, okay, I guess the secret to like having insane win rates is not really being too invested. All right, cool. And uh, that's sort of that's sort of how my week's been. It's just been like, man, this stuff is really, really crushing. Uh, I think, you know, people are going to want to hear my opinion on Thanos. And yeah, I'd be happy to see it nerfed again. But I, th- I honestly do think people are overreacting just a little bit like, oh, it's still the best deck by so much. <sighs> God, I'm going to be honest. I really don't know that it is. I think that there's just a lot of players who are really used to playing Thanos and it didn't get nerfed enough to knock those players off of Thanos. And a lot of those players are the best players in the game. And uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to think people are overreacting a little bit because you know what this meta actually is, is like the best meta for you to play like whatever terrible long deck you've always wanted to play. Mm. It's and not you, Brendan, but like you person who has a favorite bad long deck. This is the time. <laughs> Yeah, I would say my week was pretty much the opposite experience where I didn't put a lot of uh, effort or care into something and uh, my, my I didn't perform well as a result of it, but that is how flesh and blood goes. I came back from the pro tour here in Los Angeles. Um, I did pretty well in, in uh, the constructed format, but I bombed my draft. Uh, I do absolutely despise flesh and blood drafts, uh, only mostly from a competitive perspective. Casually, I think it can be pretty fun. Competitively, it's tough because it is it differs from magic draft in the sense that um, a lot of the cards you draft really, really matter, and the margins for error in terms of like waffling between a class or a different because they can't the the cards are not playable in like multiple classes is very small. So you have to you can't even like wheel the pack and be like, oh, I should pivot. And if you do, you're usually fucked anyway. Um, which is what happened to me, TLDR. But uh, yeah, basically, you're very much incentivized in Flesh and Blood to pick something early, stay in your lane, force, send the signal, and I hate that draft experience um but for me i was in a i was in a pod i get a pack flesh and blood does not have bombs it does not have bombs and mythics are often lower powered than the the comments i open the only bomb in the set pack one pick one and the narrative starts you know the music starts going but i'm on on top of the stage pro tour champion brendan patrick here we come and i'm like okay i'm in first (laughs) first tournament back crushing (laughs) right yeah and it go and then my entire pod and i was like and i have to force brute to do this and then my entire pod to the right of me proceeds to force the living shit out of brute and i'm like oh my god for the first time in two years i need to pivot to a different class in this pod. So I have to do like a pick seven, pick eight pivot to guardian. Um, I'm the one guardian of the pod, which is good. Everybody in my pod uh, post the draft realizes that I'm the solo guardian. They all think that they're going to lose, but they don't realize that my deck is also trash because I had the pivot. So I had, um, yeah, a 31 card deck, which is not ideal in that kind of format. Uh, Flesh and blood, like it's, I won't go into deep, into it too deeply, but like deck damage, attrition, fatigue, like all these concepts are very important while playing a game like limited. So, um, you'd actually rather have like 35 to 38, uh, to 37 playable cards. You've already gone deeper than I understand. Yeah. You lost me at brute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but basically my deck sucks. So I bought my draft, okay. um, and I did pretty well in CC. I really, in class, in the constructed format, I enjoy playing constructed. I was playing the combo deck that I really, really enjoy. The combo deck that does cool. Shocked. Yep, the cool combo deck that does cool things is played by cool people. You know how it is. Uh, I had a great. Is this Kano? Yeah, I had a great time playing okay. Kano. I love Kano. Okay. Kano. Kano also put one player into the top eight of the Pro Tour. Put one player in the into the top eight of the Day Two tournament, the Calling. Oh, it's like a tier three tournament, and one player into the top eight of the Eternal format tournament that happened on Sunday. So, and you were all three of those players. Could have been, but you know, <laughs> I had to tap the homies and let them get a let them right. get some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you had to ship the tech, and sometimes you give someone a deck, and they just do better with it than you. Yeah, yeah I get it. Ultimately, dude, I actually had more fun than I expected. I think mostly because I played that deck, but the uh, the experience at those kind of events is really fun. Like it was just the whole scene was electric, or the whole atmosphere was electric. So 
I enjoyed it. But yeah, there was apparently like a play in the top eight that yeah, involved Heidi someone top decking a one hour, a one outer. Yeah, Lisan Al Gaib. That's the uh, huh? <laughs> that's what they call this. I, can, I can't remember the French player's name, but they everybody's photoshopping him and they're putting like him in a Fremen suit with the blue eyes and they call him Lisan Al Gaib because yeah, basically if you've ever seen the famous magic play where Lightning's Helix is top decked as the only out, he does that with the equivalent. In flesh and blood. Yeah, it, like I looked at the card and I was like, I don't understand what this card does. Basically, that's game, the thing that came away life. from that. It was like, is it gain three life? That's it, what it is. Yeah, it's like healing self or whatever. It's like gain three life, instant speed. And that won him the game. Yep, because the opponent's attack had dominate, which meant he could only defend with one card from hand. So he could not cover it up, and he was at one health, and he had the top deck the 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 sigil. So he top decked it not during the draw phase; it was via a effect. So he played something that's called defense reaction. He played it, and part of that text is if you play this, you can put a card from your hand on the bottom of your deck if you do draw a card. And he did right, that, so he can tripped into it. Yeah, he can tripped into it. Okay, exactly. And then okay. Lisa Al Gaib. Uh, he it's, uh, that's a crazy game where healing salve can be like a pro tour winning card <laughs> so the only reason is because his opponent did not have um a way to interact with his arcane damage basically so he has a he has a facet of his deck or one card in his every deck. time you introduce a new piece like, of terminology i'm just like <laughs> basically sure. he has a facet of his deck that the opponent can't interact with like it's uninteractable damage the opponent could have cards in their deck that could do that but they've chosen not to because it is minimal damage so as a result of going up through life and surviving another turn cycle the opponent is dead because both players were at one so again it is as it is written the sonal guide okay <laughs> Let's hit these at the A's. Everybody's like, dude, the comments, by the way, uh, they were insane. We had like over 100, maybe even over 150 comments. And I think 100 of them were, this is my favorite X podcast. And it got, yeah, wild. this is my favorite podcast where they joke about being my favorite podcast. Yeah. All right. OTAs. Um, let's just go through them and then we can kind of group together all of the, uh, what are those guys called? Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, oh man, I'm gonna get some flack for that because I forgot that for a second. Anyway, first one here is Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel moves from a 4 4 to a 4 5. Uh, <laughs> that is my entire statement. Yeah, seems, I mean, it's, a, it's an upgrade, so we'll see in yep. the future. I, I Shout mean, it's Cerebro 5. Yeah, if, you fucking, well, you did it. <laughs> again, Cerebro 5, knocking on the door. Mr. Oh, yeah. Adam Warlock, 5 4 to 5 5. Oof, Cerebro 5, knocking on that door, baby. Nah, I I, th I think one thing that got massively overlooked and people are hyping Cerebro 5 is it lost its best card a couple months ago, uh, Miss Marvel, and it's hard to recover from that when you're a deck that already kind of sucks. <laughs> all due respect to the Cerebro 5 gamers. Yeah. Psylocke, 2-2 two, two to 2-1. Two, people shit on this, and they're wrong, and I'm right. Uh... This is a great nerf. People are like, oh, why would you nerf Psylocke? Well, if you look at numbers, she was one of the best cards in the deck. And that is true, both according to uh, stuff Glenn Jones has said about their internal numbers and also just, you know, on untap.gg. And she was only played in Thanos. And and I don't know if they're ever going to like. I don't know. I don't know if this played into it or if it did, if they'll ever admit it or any of that stuff. But if if you bring me two cards to nerf. All else held equal, they're the same. I would much rather nerf the series three card than the one people paid money for. Yeah. So if you if you come to me and you're like, I've got a Thanos nerf that doesn't nerf the card we're currently selling, <laughs> I think I would listen to that person. That's that's sort of that's sort of where my head would be at. Uh, no, the Psylocke nerf is is smart because it. A, brings it down to the level of the other two drops that you play, and B, I think you're probably a lot of the time still priced into playing it, which means it's just a free power you get to take off. All right, Apocalypse 6-8 six, to 6-6. Six, six. I don't get this one. I agree, Discard needed a nerf if... Uh, hold on. Uh, I actually want to start a different spot here. Mm -hmm. This is... Uh, I, I, I've gotten this comment. I've seen people talk about it. They're, like People are saying, like, you know, Glenn... Why did you nerf Discard by nerfing Apocalypse instead of Hella? I just wanted to get out ahead of that. Those are not the same deck. It might be easy for you to understand that they're both Discard decks, yes. But when I talk about Hella, that's the archetype Hella. When mm -hmm. I talk about Discard, overwhelmingly, I am referring to Apocalypse Discard. And drawing that distinction, 
helps us to better illuminate why that deck needed a nerf, which is uh, it was the only other good deck. And if you're nerfing the best deck, you need to hit the second best deck, especially if it's so far ahead of everything else the way discard was. Uh, issue is I don't really think this meaningfully hit discard. I think it's still pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm in agreement with you. It, it felt a little powerful, so... I'm happy to see how a uh, two power nerf plays out over the next few weeks to a month or so. So seems good to me. Next one is Thanos. Mindstone uh, changes from a one one to a two one. Entire energy. That's it's meaningful, but it's not meaningful enough to outweigh a zero nine, which is I think the trap a lot of these Thanos nerfs are getting caught in, right? Where it's like it's not exactly appreciating just how good Mockingbird is in the deck to like like you can hit this stuff around the margins and i think in basically every other context of thanos it would have gone away by now but you gave it a zero nine mm. and so now you need to hit it enough that that zero nine is not good there right and that's a big ask yeah i think if this nerf came at any other time and and thanos life cycle prior to mockingbird i would have been big sad to say the least. Yeah, like, this this would this is like they're, they're like this is what i'm talking about where i'm like kind of worried they're going to over nerf thanos right because in order to get effectively a free nine power out of the deck, like that's what they're trying to do with these nerves is counterbalance a free nine power. That's a hard, hard thing to do. I, 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 I shudder to think what they have in the can. <laughs> <laughs> they must have some stuff that's just like, oh boy, I do not want to know what they're going to do to him next because uh, they're probably going to do something to him. Yeah. I mean, it's only so long until he becomes, like, the next Kitty Pride or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, for the Guardians of the Galaxy, do you want to talk about them in aggregate, or do you have some you want to pick and choose? I'm fine talking about them however you want to talk about them. Just group them together. Like, like, is it, uh, do you, yeah, exactly. So, not a particularly meaningful change. Anything gets you excited? Like, any specific one? Star-Lord. So, Star-Lord changed from a 2-2. Uh, same Rocket. Yeah. Same... Same stat line 2-2, but now it gets plus 4 power instead of plus 3. And Rocket Raccoon yeah. is now a 1-1 one, one instead of a 1-2, and gets plus 4 power instead of plus 2. It's good numbers. A 1-5 and a 2-6. There are decks that are kind of interested in that. It's a shame we're never going to get to see them as long as... It's not just Thanos doing this, it's just like... The metagame is very built to do very good stuff right now. And it's hard for you to sell me on this 1-5 is going to matter when there's you know free zero nines phoenix force generally the whole deck discard like just just a lot of stuff that goes pretty tall in ways that i find it hard to believe that a one five is relevant against and this also applies to the two six it's just the two six may have a little bit more of a home in some sort of thor control type deck that's built to be Sarah without losing to Mobius. Uh, you could talk me into the two six there, I think, pretty readily. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right, Cannonball. Uh, Cannonball releases the new card. to five eight. It says, on reveal, move the highest power enemy card here. Uh, move the highest power enemy card here away. Sorry, I put a comment there. If you can't, destroy it with a rock. He's fine. Like, I think Cannonball's issue is one of competition. And I think there's just a lot of, like, like, I wouldn't be shocked if Cannonball ends up like the junk version of Jane Foster, mm -hmm. where it's just like, you only really play it here, but if you want to play the archetype, you have to play it, right? And it's hard to weigh how good getting one of those is. Like, the, the, the top end of an example of that would be like Modoc, right? But Modoc only really became this, like, you have to get it because this deck is really good after A, Proxima, B, Corvus, C, Meek, to some degree, right? and a Helicarrier rework. And so like, yeah, if Junk gets that level of support, I could see Cannonball being a really important thing to pick up. It's just, I don't know if we're there. You know what I mean? Absolutely. All right, on to the Bend and Snap. This is our listener question section. We did ask for a lot of questions specifically in this episode because I was going to be away. Um, mm -hmm. We got an absolute shitload, which is great. We really appreciate that. Um, I am once again going to ask you for questions for next week because we are planning to have Glenn on. I haven't circled back with him yet, but we do have that date booked, so I'm assuming it's going to happen. So if you have questions for Glenn, the lead game designer of Marvel Snap, put him in the YouTube comments. I don't comments. think that's his title. He's like the lead balance guy. Lead balance guy? Interesting. 
Did it change? Uh, maybe it's changed. he's a senior game designer. I don't know. I thought he was the I lead. Know, I don't I, know. I, I, like, I, I worry that we'd be inaccurate by calling him lead game designer. I feel like that's a different thing. But like, it could be. Maybe? So the 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 difference could be like, uh, yeah. The ones I can get mixed up are like design developer. But I did. I do remember mm-hmm. looking it up last time when I wrote it in the title. Okay. And I asked lead him, game designer Marvel Snap, Glenn Jones, CEO. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> 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 all right yeah shoot us your questions there um and yeah anything any burning questions that are appropriate and keep them tame please because he is a guest um so try to be try to be nice and if you want to get something seriously answered shoot it in the comments below we got it queued up all right ben and snap first one oh first i just want to say we had a bunch of comments about doom imperium uh i did get the expansions <laughs> <laughs> I did. So the, the problem that I had with the game uh, was basically like the, the draft would stagnate because card gamers realized that adding a card to your deck is bad unless the card is obscenely broken. Uh, they did kind of fix that in like one of the expansions and there is like some sort of like uh, ad hoc rule people have added on. But yeah, I had a great time. Honestly, I wasted a lot of my Pro Tour testing playing Dune Imperium and it was great. It was well spent. <laughs> All right. Next one is from Zegram. They say Agency Simps is now added to my lexicon Along with favorable outcome, please. When talking yeah. about card games, still haven't sent you that meme, but I will. You haven't. It's gonna come. It's gonna come eventually. Disrespectful, really. I did. I was with uh, Simon Nielsen this uh, this past weekend, who is the um, the originator, the agency simp, yeah, writer. The yeah, originator of agency simps. All right, next one from Slippy. They say I was contemplating cleaning my dishes when Cam said, "If you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean." I ended up laughing so hard I choked on my food. The dishes were clean that day. It sucks. It sucks that that works on. It sucks that that worked on you. I hate that shit so much. If you're ever an employer and you say that shit, you should sell your business. I. Like, it's just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You got time to lean. You got time to clean. Next one's from Wildfire. They say for the mailbag episode, how much sooner do content creators get the official OTA patches? And what's your favorite wrestler of all time? I am not only am I not allowed to disclose that information, I don't even know if I'm allowed to confirm or deny that content creators get any access to that. So as far as I know, uh, I get at the same time you do. Uh, Favorite wrestler was the second part of that? Yeah. Of all time or of right now? I think all time. All time. I mean, I don't want to say it because he's like a sex pervert, but Ric Flair. (laughs) Really? I didn't know that little tidbit, but yeah. Oh, you didn't know? Okay, like, isn't that just like the most believable thing you've ever heard, though? Like, you're like, yeah, Ric Flair, that's definitely a guy who would have fine, upstanding morals when it comes to women. I'm probably not going to check your sources. I'm probably just going to take your word on it. He, he, there are some concerning allegations regarding a plane ride he took once. Oh, great. I just got off a plane. Um, Disgusting. All right, next one is from Jaren. They say, oh, by the way, I don't have a favorite wrestler. I don't think I've ever watched wrestling in my life. And I I, I know I might get some flack for that, but I, I haven't, so I don't have one. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I do. Next one's from Jaren. They say, Ben to Snap, what card combo is just one card away from being really a really good package, um, a.k.a. from being the new Hood Sentry Annihilus? <sighs> Okay, so Thanos Mockingbird? No. Uh, (laughs) I I would say what we're currently seeing is like, you know, Corvus Glaive Proxima stuff doing that, right? Um, I think if I had to guess, thinking about like the future cards coming out in April, Maybe something bounce related. I feel like at any given point, Beast is liable to do something stupid. Uh, maybe War Machine, Ebony Maw, Shield. War Machine, Ebony Maw, Infinite. I mean, that's possible. Yeah, possible. Uh, yeah, possible. All right, Maverick. Uh, a couple of questions for next week. Number one: Do you think the tournament scene is realistic with the current collection system? No. Uh, but it's not necessarily because of the collection system. It's because there's no spectator mode. Mm. Collection system hurts, but no spectator mode. Like, we were talking about how to run a tournament earlier, me and a couple of my friends, and it's just like, okay, well, we need someone to run the stream, and then we also need someone to coordinate the TO stuff, right? So you have to have someone making sure everyone gets in their matches, right? You have to have someone running the 
stream on delay to somewhere else. And then you have to have the two people who are commentating commentate over the stream. And it's like, that's just kind of a lot of people that unless you can get your friends to do it for free, you're going to have to pay. And that is to say nothing of the actual prizes necessary to run a tournament at this point. I do not think that there is any way with current Marvel Snap to make that a profitable venture. And that means that it will be subsidized by people looking for name recognition, a la the Lambie series open with, I believe, community gaming, right? Like they pay, they give them the prize pool and that's how it works. So it is subsidized in that way. And that is kind of or the snap fan open, right? Snap fan is subsidizing it for the purposes of marketing, right? And I think that's sort of a dubious value prop. And uh, I'd be a little surprised if it ever got beyond that before spectator mode came out. Yeah, maybe second dinner could advertise Marvel snap by doing that as well. But <clears throat> yeah, we'll see. Mm. This is a really funny Intriguing. one because we actually talked about this a lot prior to battle mode coming out prior to tournaments being put on like back in the old, old, old days. We're like, are they just going to ban series five? Like we had that conversation uh, yeah. to its validity. I, I can't really speak, but we had that conversation a lot in the other days. Like, Oh, I guess we have to ban series five because it's so expensive and they were hard to get. And you had to like roll them in your shop. Sometimes it, it was a pain. Um, but ultimately, honestly, it didn't turn out as bad as I thought, like coming back and, you know, practicing or for snap fan or playing a tournament, it is inconvenient to get the cards, but it's not an insurmountable hurdle. That being said, like you do usually have to deploy some capital, which is unfortunate if you hadn't been playing the game. So it is what yep. it is, but uh, it, I thought it was going to be way worse than it is, to be honest. I thought like almost no one would be able to compete in these, but yeah, it's whatever. Second question from this person is, unless a major chain is made early to card acquisition or overall, do you think the game will only exhibit attrition and not growth? To semi-explain, I don't see how in another year a new player could come into the game with such a random and vast pool three and zero resources for pool four slash five and want to even tackle building a collection. The game feels like it's made uh, feels like it's made to beta players and whales and lack Sorry, and a lack of growth concerns me, which ties into monetization for those FTP, F to play, free to play gamers uh, who help fulfill our cues. Uh, a lack of growth also concerns me. Mm -hmm. I know Hearthstone has done a lot of stuff in terms of alleviating those barriers, right? Like they'll just leave you like pre made decks for sale and stuff yep. like that. It's something I've kicked around a lot, but I'd imagine that, you know, the issue is. I think a lot of things that would be objectively good for the game would be rejected by a large part of the player base because they would involve making something they spent a lot of money on easy to acquire. Yeah, that is that is a hilarious and absolutely accurate take. Absolutely accurate. Um, that sucks. <laughs> that just totally it sucks. Does. Yeah, because like, like, I, I think pissed, like right? if you I think you could probably pitch second dinner on 50 bucks, get a deck. Right. You could probably pitch them on that. Maybe it wouldn't be the perfect destroy deck. Maybe it would just like be missing. I don't know. Ah, Venom or some shit, right? Like or null or whatever. But 50 bucks, get a deck. You could probably pitch them on that. But then everyone who bought X23 full price is furious. Furious. You know? The that the gatekeeping that I mean that happens in like uh, a lot of different aspects. The, but the gatekeeping there is super bizarre. Um, it happens in like i don't know it happens in tcgs too when like people when cards when card availability is really low or they're really expensive uh like players take a lot of pride in other people not having cards and like absolutely no proxies allowed no chance and it's just like why do you play this game like what the fuck are you doing like it doesn't make any sense to me it's like the most bizarre take it's like do you just want to play this game like by yourself with nobody like it's so weird it's like if you add any barrier of entry to a card game all you're doing is hurting your own experience ultimately super yep. weird super weird um and uh i, I don't know I, I i'm hoping <laughs> i guess i'm hoping that by discussing it we can like get enough groundswell around it that'll convince second dinner it's a good idea but the other thing i'm thinking about is like you know it used to be they would make a monetization change and people would get mad about that they'd be like holy shit you're letting these people get my cards for that i spent so much money on for free what the fuck right and i gotta say 
I think that's a good reaction to create with your changes because it means you're doing something right. Mm-hmm. Like if those people are mad at you, good, good job. You did good. And I got to say, I don't think those people have been mad in a while. Yeah, I think I think I think it's probably about time for them to get mad. Yeah, it's a weird logical fallacy. where You're like, oh, I paid one hundred dollars, a hundred dollars for this card. Everybody else must do that as well. It can never be cheaper. It's it's a bummer, but it, it definitely would piss people off. And it would probably piss off the their user base that spends the most money unfortunately mm-hmm. um yeah, I, like that would be that would be something that i'd be really interested in seeing if they could do pre-cons of some kind yeah i would love to see that as well i mean honestly anything that increases the accessibility of the game i'm 100 percent for uh next one is conrack says ben a snap question for next pod would changing mockery burn to a 7 8 cost card be a good change to the card she becomes a death type car- death type card uh for cards that don't start in the deck if she's eighth, then at least she could uh, she could be would be two costs in Thanos potentially one with lucky with a lucky time stone hit. Also, if the cost went up, would it be good to would it be good to make her more powerful so that she dies to Shang Chi? Question mark. I'm a Thanos player and I definitely love her as an addition, but I do understand how frustrating slash unhealthy she is for the game. And um, yeah, giving for the game it is. To, I understand how unhealthy it is for the game to give Thanos an easy to play nine power card. I think that's a terrible idea. Um, Here's why. Thanos is currently her best home. You make that change, Thanos will still be her best home. All you will accomplish is you maybe made her unplayable everywhere else. And that sucks. I hate when they do stuff like that. It's like when they did the the original collector change with Loki, where it was like, oh, we're going to make it a 2-0, right? And that way we'll make it so... And then literally only Loki can play the card now. <laughs> it's like, well, if you didn't, like, it, it, yeah. It, and, like, they, they ended up having to revert that and going back to making a change that actually fixed the issue with Loki. The analogy here would be they try this, it doesn't work. They go back and say, okay, Infinity Stones don't work with it, right? Like, that's what happened with Loki and Collector. I don't want them to have to go through that same process here. Uh, no, I think that would be a terrible idea. I think, you know, you could talk me into, like, 6 11 6 12 6 10 right you can talk me into those numbers if you wanted to uh everyone's gonna get mad at me but like i think even those numbers you end up with very odd scar situations where it's like i don't think i'd want to give her a point of power in that in that in that either right because you end up making just like second cull obsidian a decent amount of the time or you go like you know curve her into cull obsidian cheapest scar of all time kind of deal and I think that that's something you'd really want to avoid with her. So, yeah, I don't like making her six, seven or eight. You could talk me into six, but if she goes to six, I want her to stay at nine. Mm-hmm. I think that's uh, that's a good reason. Next one's from Matthew. I say, what is your go-to recipe when you have to cook? And what is your signature dish? Yeah, it's called DoorDash. <laughs> Bro, <laughs> it's so funny because when I copy paste this comment into the notes... I heard your voice say that line. I yeah, no, it's very, it's very, it's a very me joke to make. Uh, if I had to say one, I don't cook a lot, but I have a recipe for I believe it's like honey mustard ginger salmon and sesame green beans that my mom gave me that I make. Uh, that that would be like. If my girlfriend was like, I want us to cook dinner kind of deal, it'd be something along those lines. But I tend to be uh, very utilitarian about my food. Like I'm drinking a protein shake right now. I don't yeah. I don't really go for that. Right. Uh, I actually my my like personal me time treat dish. I'll just cook up an entire thing of po- protein pasta and I will add spices, uh, you know, like onion powder, salt, pepper, uh, sesame until it tastes like an everything bagel. I do love me That's some what everything bagel seasoning. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that, right? And so I was like, what if I just did that on pasta? I tried it one day and I was like, this this is absolutely awesome. Mm. <laughs> I really enjoy it. <clears throat> That's funny because that ties into my signature dish. My signature dish is you grab a whole avocado, you cut it open, you take out the thing in the center. Uh, the pit? Yes, sir. And then... <laughs> You cut qua- you cut like uh, lines into it, and then you put everything bagel seasoning on it. Then you squeeze a little bit of lemon on it, and you just eat that. That's about as fancy as I get, bro. I don't really cook either, to be honest. The everything bagel seasoning uniting us is is nice. What do you? What is your everything bagel seasoning recipe? 
Oh, I buy the pre-made stuff, the one that's like organic. Oh, and I didn't even know that existed. I literally oh. just sort of reverse engineered it. I didn't know the other one existed. I didn't oh know that you could just MacGyver it yourself. I mean, obviously. Yeah, you can, no, but- <laughs> I just like I was messing. I was messing with our uh, our spices one day. I was just like, wonder if I could make this taste like an everything bagel. And I could. Yeah. Well, you can get that shit uh, prepackaged, ready to go, nice. perfectly distributed. Like, it's amazing. So highly nice. recommend. Um, next one is from 10. They say, what characters from Marvel Comics are you a fan of and are interested in that are not in the game and what ability would they have? Oh, not in the game? You think I know a single <laughs> yeah, Marvel character that's not in the game? <laughs> Holy okay, I got one for you, actually. I know Gwenpool. I know one thing about Gwenpool, and it's that she specifically requested that her her Wikipedia page be updated to include the fact that she has dynamite gams as listed <laughs> as one of her superpowers. And so it's currently there. And I think that rocks. So I'm going to say Gwenpool. <laughs> You came to the wrong place with this one. That's all I gotta say. I, I got I got nothing for you. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting because um, you I think, think should have Kano. I think Cam and I came from the generation that didn't get exposed to comics as much. Like we were like five or ten years behind that, and instead we got exposed to what started out, in my opinion, as good Marvel movies. And then what is now is like a terror to modern cinema. That's an opinion. If you don't agree with it, that's okay. But take it up with Martin Scorsese. Take it up with Martin Scorsese. (laughs) But yeah, so um, (laughs) it is pretty unfortunate. I've heard like good things about, you know, comics in the 90s. I'm sure that they're still good today. But I heard that there was like quite a scene that they were they were a fun culture to be a part of. But I think I missed. Yeah, we missed out. We missed out on all the glory days of like Rob Liefeld drawing some guy who has 800 different accoutrements on him and a chest the size of my head or three of my head. I guess a chest the size of two of my chest would be a better way to phrase it. (laughs) Uh, We missed the glory days. Hey, it's too bad. It's too bad. I do. I I do miss the uh, I do miss the 90s. I I will say that I don't. Uh, you kidding I me? Do. I do, I do. You know how bad the internet was then? Never again, dude. I do, bro. I was playing World of Warcraft on the family computer in God. like the middle of the house on dial-up internet. Come I on. I miss that. I was gaming, bro. Yeah, for me it was RuneScape, and I, I don't miss that. Also, I also hit a little RuneScape, too. Um, next one is from Muggy Wara. They said, do you think Second Dinner will ever release variants of cards that were previously in Spotlight caches? I made the mistake of not spending extra Spotlight key to get the iconic comic book cover Thanos variant, and I regretted it every day since. Yeah, probably. Didn't they say they were going to do that at some point? I don't know. I just figured they would show up in Spotlight caches again at some time. They would huh. just like recycle them. They're definitely going to recycle I, them. That's like just like the modern thing that these companies do. Like, yeah, I don't know. I've just seen it so many times with um, other card games. It's also just like other digital games. Uh, they have like some sort of variant that you can get from, you know, logging in on Valentine's Day or some special thing where it's like, it was kind of cool that you were there and then people get pissed off that they didn't get it. And ultimately they just kind of re-release it. So I'm assuming that that's just like standard practice nowadays. Um Next one is from the same person, but they say two. When Snap uh, releases clans or whatever they end up calling them, what would be your top two picks for Marvel related clan names that you would name a clan if you made one? Question mark. Dynamite Gams. Dynamite. <laughs> Dude, what is that system going like that? What even? I have no idea. Yeah, that's like the, this is like a mo. This is like a mobile native thing, right? This is like a thing that yeah. happens on mobile games. It does nothing for me. I, I feel like know. it's like a it's like a MLM, like multi level marketing kind of thing. Yes, <laughs> it is, bro. It's so like, I would need to start a clan just so like the members of my clan being on the leaderboard would get me clout. Mm. <laughs> like that's the only incentive I could think of. I am recruiting the five of you to get five of your friends that get five of their friends to get on top of the leaderboard. <laughs> And if we, we do have this- we have some excellent knives for sale. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm interested to see what they do with that because I'm pretty sure it's like a very mobile gamey thing. And I guess Marvel Snap's audience is mobile gamers, but I I think that K- at least Cam and I are a bit insulated against that because we're, we're paper on- boomers. Well, we're on the card game side of it. Like we're not yeah, we're on paper like- boomers. Yeah. yeah. So clans, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, anyway, they say, as always, I love the show and your in-depth analysis in the game state and current metas. Guys, keep up the great work. And Cam, I hope to see your stream this week to collect my Twitch drops and rewards. I hope that went well for you. 
Nice. Next one is from ES. They say, what are your favorite single player card games? Do you like roguelike deck builders such as the Aspire, Monster Train, and Bellatro? If you haven't played Bellatro, you need to. I have never played if you a play single the- player card game. Oh. Never. Not Inscription. Not Bellatro. Never. Okay. Well, let me break some down. The last you. single player card game I played was the CD that came with Magic Starter Set in 7th edition. Is that Shalandar? Ta- Shalandar? No, not, 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 sh- not Shandalar. Shandalar. Uh, the, the, the one that came in a box with a thorn elemental on the front and would teach you how to play Magic the Gathering. That is the last single player card game I played. All right. Let me break it down. I play a lot of card games. And I generally don't like single player card games. It's weird. I've had to analyze this. Like I've had to go in the hole and like confront the abyss. I'm like, why is this the case? And I think it's because card games are a conduit for me to beat my opponent. I think I enjoy the personal aspect, the imperfect and, and the perfect aspect of my opponent and their plays. Like the dynamic, how dynamic it is. I think I enjoy that part. And when it's that's not the thing, I don't enjoy as much. That being said, there are some there are some games that are cut above the rest that are excellent enough that even I can play them. And Bellatro is one of them. Bellatro is a great game. I would highly recommend that game. It is very addicting. It might affect your stream schedule, so maybe you should stay away from it. Uh, other than that, I do, th- in my opinion, and um, I-, I know this will piss some of you off, I do think that Slay the Spire is a little overrated. <clears throat> That's like the most sacrilegious thing I think you can say in, in card games right there. Cam, you gotta come maybe. out. You just gotta back me up and be like, Slay the Spire sucks. I've never played it. <laughs> that's not the point know, you're know. my boy you're supposed to say <laughs> what <sighs> i've never played the de- i like <laughs> people like i i don't want to give my opinion on something i've never played come on i'm not gonna back you up on that what if it's good what it's if all, it's good and i get yeah. clipped out of context and made to look like a fool on the internet in five years it's all good ride or die i guess you're you're just not, you're just I, not I guess the I one, bro. yeah yeah <laughs> next one is robert riven they say i enjoy watching a snapshot a lot more than playing the freaking game Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think we actually do have a legitimate non-zero amount of listeners that actually don't play anymore, but still listen to the podcast, which is... Well, yeah, it's, they're learning about flesh and blood. Yeah, bro. Yeah, I mean, they, they are happy to tell us that, too. <laughs> One person was like... Um, actually, their comment was like, actually, in regards to feedback, but they're like, oh, but the way you talk about flesh and blood, I don't think that it would encourage someone to play the game. And I think it's like super True. fair. And they're like... Because, but mostly because the audience is not doesn't know the game, right? Like if I if I talk about my criticisms on like our on my uh, Flesh and Blood podcast, then it's like oh they have context and they can make their own opinions. But I think the one part where it kind of missed was like it was they said it wouldn't incentivize someone to, or it wouldn't encourage someone to Flesh and Blood. I don't think I would encourage someone to Flesh and Blood to be honest. You would have to ask me a very specific question for me to say play this game, and it would be. What is the like highest fidelity competitive card game that I can grind my face off and like maybe win money and like travel the world and play? That's the only criteria in which you're like, this is the game, I think, at this point. Nice. But yeah. Next one. Zo. Just started listening recently. Oh man, this one's pretty funny. <laughs> I've been going back through all the old episodes starting at one. In episode six, Brendan said, I'm a Thanos romantic, like want Thanos to be S tier. I just want to be playing that deck. Thanos is a card that is so unique compared to everything else in Marvel Snap because of how much the deck, how much deck manipulation and card draw gives you. It's so interesting. My question is, does he still agree with the sentiment or has his opinion changed? Not a real question, just the benefit of hindsight that has made, uh, made so, some of them fun to listen to now. Yeah, and you said no one would ever go back and clip me out of context if I said Slay the Spire sucks. <laughs> Here you go, buddy. Here's, here's a year later. Um, yeah. I actually do... I still do agree with that, but I, I think that the, sh- the shells that Thanos has uh, sort of, or like the archetypes that it's fit into so far, with like the big stuff, the lockjaw, uh, it wasn't, I still think the card is awesome. Like my, my statement about the card, I would still, I would say the same thing today, but yeah, some of the strategy has gotten a bit degenerate. Um, I do really enjoy Thanos though. Next one is from Perplatypus. They say, I've seen both Dune I've seen both Dune m- movies and honestly, I don't know much about the world still. Everyone says how crazy it gets. Um, but the movies keep it mostly tame in terms of weird stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm interested if the audiobooks are worth a listen, but the description the description of tripping balls in monologues does not immediately appeal to me. Yeah, I mean if 
If you're not into that, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I I tend to think that like Dune is uh look, I don't know a better way to say it. It reads old, right? Like you read it and you can tell you are reading something that is dated, right? Mm. And that's fine, right? But if you're looking for something like that's, you know, something worth investing in or or all that, like uh, <laughs> the weirdness of Dune's world building is mostly done through like throwaway lines, if that yep. makes sense. Right. Like he'll just offhand mention that, like, you know, space travel is conducted via people getting so high on spice they can see into the future well enough to navigate in space like that's. But just like a throwaway line, right? The reason Dune spoilers, the reason Paul's play at the end works in the books is because his control of spice gives him control over the uh, the spacing guild and what is referred to as Choam, uh, C-H-O-A-M. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm never going to. I read it like it, no one's ever said that word out loud. <laughs> Fuck you, uh, which is like the like the spice distributing conglomerate basically. And those are like the true powers uh, in, in the uh, M- Imperium. Like the empire isn't exactly a f- the emperor isn't exactly a figurehead, but he is to some degree beholden to the interests of space commerce. Right. And those are the big companies that control it. I think that the universe of Dune is awesome. Um, I think that the world building is cool. I think like the different factions are really well done. Like there's a lot, there's a lot that you can go down a lot of paths and like, it's just, it's just a sweet world that Frank Herbert built. That being said, it is no, it is nowhere near the reason why I love the book. The reason why I love yeah. the book is the ball tripping per se. <laughs> Like it is, it is really good. Like it, it's, um, I would say it gets a, it's, I mean, maybe it's a bit full of itself sometimes and it, it reads a bit philosophical, but it's, it's really well done. Like I read Dune thinking it was going to be a fantasy book and I was, I was shocked. Like I was, I, and I was hooked as well. Like it's a really, really good book. Um, it's in, in, in regards to books reading old. It does though. Yeah. Right. Like I, the one I counted that the most, the most with though was Lord of the Rings. I feel like Lord of the Rings reads old in a more charming way. Yeah, maybe my ADD brain can't read songs because I would get to a song and I yeah, would just be like, like Bro. It, it, it reads old like a fairy tale, you mm-hmm. know, like it reads old in a different way. Whereas Herbert reads old like an old man describing something to you. Like it's a little different, I feel like. I have to give a lack of whimsy. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think that for sure, definitely a lack of whim- whimsy. I have to give you a recommendation for the the audiobook is actually pretty good. I'm pretty sure that they have an audiobook that is like act has like multiple voice actors, has like sounds in the background. It's like one of those special ball, special audi- audible ones. I recommend that. So if you're looking for the audiobook, I'll learn how to pronounce the word choam. Choam. Yeah, I don't. I've. I. It's funny because you said that. I've thought the same thing the entire time. I've just like I've never spoken I've, I've the word it aloud. Chom. Yeah, I've called head. it chom. Yeah, it's been chom. Yeah. For me. Chom. Yeah. All right. Uh, next one is from Matthew. They said, what is the worst part about being a commentator for events? That's a you question. Buddy. You go first. I've done you it like co- three times. Yeah, but you go first. Uh, the worst part? I mean, for me, it's the travel because the travel is unpaid. Right. And I later learned that, you know, yeah. I, I am aware of some commentators for whom that is not true. Yeah, <laughs> you charge travel rate too. I didn't know that. We should time. explain what that means too. So travel n- travel not being paid doesn't mean that his, uh, the flights are not paid for, the hotel is not paid for. It means the time that you are traveling is not paid for. I would say that in TCGs that is industry standard, but this is one of the delightful things about casting. You'll soon realize that not everybody gets the same deal. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this this was uh, this was brought up to me uh, at some point. Yes, or someone pointed out like, hey, man, you really should have asked them to pay you like 75 percent for that. Uh, <laughs> to those travel days. Yep. Um, for me, there's a lo- there's a lot of things that are that are downsides, I guess. But there's a lot of upsides, too. I would say the main one for me is that in the end, if you try to do this in like a serious capacity and you do it in a recurring way, uh, it is political. At the end of the day, it is political and it's not fun because of that. There's a lot of people, there's, 
ultimately, I think casting is, in a lot of sense, a race to the bottom. Everybody thinks that they can be a caster, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think a lot of a lot of people can, and they should try it. Um, but it is not. It leads to an unfun process of like competing to basically unsustainability for everybody that is that is a part of that. But ultimately, on the back end, a lot of casting and casting gigs and like who gets the gig, who doesn't, like our group or or the other group, or do we new people or no new people? It is very very political, and yeah, it's just not fun because that that's not why you're you're interested in casting. And it's like so far away from the card game and the broadcast. And I think that's the biggest downside. I think it's almost unavoidable too. It's not like this production company or that or this game or that game. It's just like human beings just tend to inherently be like that. Be like that. (laughs) To put put it eloquently, humans just be like that. Um, But it just happens because it's sort of a, uh, I don't know. It's just like, it's like an industry where people kind of get in and then they try to secure like the, the gig happening over and over again. And they kind of curate that space to do that. And it just, it's, yeah, it's not super fun. It's political at the end of the day. Molly's favorite part. That sounds like someone who got out politics to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. The house of cards just, you know, it tumbled on me. Um, the game, the game of Thrones. I, I couldn't do yeah. it. I couldn't he do couldn't, it. He couldn't, he couldn't win. He got, he got, he got, he got Peter Baelish. <laughs> I got Peter Baelish. I couldn't do it anymore. All right. Next one is from Torakun. They say, which option would you prefer? Option A, you get the entire Marvel Snap Marvel Snap collection for free, but you can never unlock any variants and all borders suck at base. Gray. Or B, the current status quo with all monetization strategies SD already uses. See, this one's weird for me because I said Snap A, but my Discord voted on this and it was two thirds B. And I don't understand. That's a wild take. <laughs> it's fucked up like i do not understand like I, like this just goes to show just how effective this marketing on bullshit is when people act like splits aren't meaningful and things looking cool aren't meaningful like that's actually crazy because like people like to pretend that it's not meaningful but it absolutely apparently at least is meaningful and meaningful to the exclusion of entire game for free that's crazy Like people talk about this stuff like bundles and whatnot and and credits in terms purely of progression. But I think like this kind of stuff makes it at least a non-zero amount clearer to me that they cannot be understood purely in terms of progression and understanding them in terms of customizing aesthetics is also helpful. I like the aesthetics of Marvel Snap. I like the customization and I like the breadth of which we can choose from. That being said... If you choose option B, what the fuck? <laughs> that's such it's a wild so take. so weird. I was, I was watching those that the bees pile in and I was like, am I on crack? What is happening here? Oh, God. I feel like everything we've talked about for the past year is just useless because all these people are like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, dude, who gives a fuck about monetization? I need my shiny shit. Yeah, which is artificially gay kept, by the way. It's just like... Oh my god! I can't complain. I, I I rolled how many times on that Thanos split? Ten? Yeah, ten different splits. Trying to get that guy gold. I get I, it. I, yeah, it provides a non-zero value, but uh, yeah, I would prefer the game to be free. All right, next one is uh, from Savai. They say, since you started playing, what was your favorite and least favorite meta game ever? Favorite? Mm-hmm. The Loki one. Yeah, that makes sense. I kind of feel like you're. I almost like think about you as like a Loki guy now. I was so far ahead of everyone else in that matter, man. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> uh, least favorite. Ah, Hella. The one where it was just Hella and Thanos. There's just lockjaw shit all the time. There's just big numbers getting dumped on you. And you were just like, I guess. It's probably that one. Yeah, it's actually harder for me to think about my least favorite. Uh, my favorite. <laughs> It's a toss up because I think I'm nostalgic for some older ones. Like I really liked any meta where I could play Death Wave. <laughs> like I actually liked that deck. It was fun. Um and I also liked the Bounce Haivo meta uh back in the day. But on least fun is probably I mean, it's just hard. I, I just worry there's a recency bias, but it's hard to disagree with like the Hello Lockjaw stuff. Like that was pretty it's oh, pretty, so bad, man. It was pretty dumpy. It was just like, oh my god, this is such a fucking eye roll. At least the current meta game has the upside of like whatever dumb bullshit you want to play, you can probably play it. 
Like, there are dudes ranking up with Clog, even though it kind of sucks into Destroy. There's dudes ranking up with Wong. Dudes ranking up with, like, there's a bunch, there's a bunch of openings. So, like, Thanos is the best deck, but it's not the best deck in such a prohibitive, you must be this tall to ride way. So, you end up in a spot where it's like, there's just kind of a lot of stuff you can do. And I think this meta is actually underratedly good. So, all right, next one is from... Hmm. I'm not sure if this is an yeah. L or an I. It definitely changes the name significantly because it's either Elsis or Isis. That's definitely Isis. Okay, it's Isis. <laughs> so do you think, uh, in quotation, taxes for not spreadsheeting is good monetization? You've discussed, you've discussed suboptimal key strategies and for now, and now for you bundles are offering uh, Series 3 cards at more cash per credit than evergreen store buttons. Is this a good way to make money without making series six like cosmetics or a long or long-term collection slow down for people um, who could later be lost? I think that's by definition, a good way to make money. Yes. Selling people stuff for more than they, we would otherwise sell it to them for. It's probably a very good way to make money. What about the thermal layer, man? Guess. What about the thermal, <laughs> the thermal layer? Line. Dude, I can't even see through all these layers of currency obfuscation to figure out if I'm getting ripped off or not. Are you kidding me? But yeah, no, I'd imagine I'd imagine it's probably a great deal. <laughs> It's probably great monetization. It sure fucking gets my ass. Yeah, thermocline copium. <laughs> how many? How many? For, ask me how many for you bundles I bought. How many for you bundles have you? Three. Bought? I bought three for you bundles. I think I've actually bought zero. But yeah. to be fair, two of them were like ten bucks. Right? It was like ten bucks premium mystery variant, fifteen hundred credits, and I like buying credits because it lets me do splits on the stream. Mm -hmm. See, aesthetics matter. Yeah, who needs a free game when we could just be splitting? <laughs> Aesthetics right. matter, buddy. Next one is from Fable. They say, what's your thoughts on the difference between Conquest and Ladder? I have success climbing Ladder, but struggle, struggle translating that to wins, an infinite or even gold Conquest. Uh, I think the thing is that Ladder is going to have a much more consistent band of opponents, meaning you're going to be playing against something that is much more guaranteed to be your level of play. Whereas in Conquest, it could be either too high or too low. For most top-end ladder players, Conquest is simply not worth investing the time in. Uh, it's just not a challenge. It just exists and is there for when you want to play stuff and not worry about tanking your rank. Yeah. I think that in Conquest, you also have to play the game mode a bit. Um, mm -hmm. like, like one of the big mistakes you can make in Conquest is in an unknown deck format, which is what, if you kill Conquest, that's what you're doing. If you snap crazy aggressively early like without seeing much of your opponent's deck list without sussing out deck cards and then you just lose like an eight cuber off the rip for what is effectively no good reason i think that that's like a critical mistake a lot of people make is they don't prioritize actually getting info on their opponent's deck before they start snapping um a lot so i think you gotta play the game mode a bit last one here is from boomer and they say who <laughs> who was your starter pokemon in blue slash red my guess is our can pick Squirtle and Brennan with Charmander. I was Squirtle towards the latter half of my career, I think. I want to say I was originally a Charmander, and then I was like a Squirtle gamer. I was originally a Squirtle. I interesting. 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 Neither of us were picking green, green then. Yeah. Huh? Who picked Venusaur? I mean, I think if I had seen that, like, honestly, going back to it, I think Venusaur was underrated. Okay. I think Venusaur is a cool ass design, and okay. I think it wow. got a bad rap because it's the one that lost to Charizard on the type matchup. Yeah, I wonder if blue and red just are colors that resonate with players more than green. I don't know. Green's a more fringe color, per se. I had the um, I had like the yellow version, like the Pikachu version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had Pikachu as my starter. Nice. Uh, yes sir all right that's all of our questions uh for this week we appreciate everybody submitting them again we have glenn on next week so submit your questions below and we'll get him queued up very excited for that we're revisiting glenn after many many months of him being on the podcast i felt like our last podcast was fantastic um we had some amazing topics in regards to the current state of model snap design the future etc we'll be circling back on a lot of those checking back in with him um I just, i'm looking at the agenda for uh the meeting on uh next time we do this and it's just gonna say like thanos 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 thanos, thanos, thanos. every topic thanos we can't let him off the hook 
Brendan, yeah. we can't let him off the hook. My favorite would be like, oh, we can't actually like ask him about the uh, monetization. Every comment would be like monetization, monetization, monetization. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, we actually probably can't. It, like, keep in mind what Glenn's actual job is. Like, yeah. he's the cards guy. I don't really think he makes any of the monetization calls. Yeah, he doesn't. He, he's the he's the lead game designer slash CEO slash founder slash no I'm kidding uh, slash Ben Bro yeah, yeah slash Ben Bro yeah I I think he's the game just lead game designer anyway okay. um if you're listening to this podcast you enjoy it number one thing you can do is leave us a review on ratethispodcast.com slash snapshot snapshot or Apple Podcasts or Spotify it helps more than anything else video version of this on YouTube at youtube.com slash the underscore snapshot hit that subscribe while you're there Twitter's at Brendan APG Cam SMS Cam is streaming in the uh, evenings. evenings. I streamed, I streamed at like midnight yesterday. <laughs> it's getting real bad out here. My sleep schedule is it's fantastic. Out of whack. It's normal. It's normal. Right. Bro. That's normal yes. if you live in Asia. I think. Like if you. Yes, <laughs> I am currently on uh, a Singaporean <laughs> sleep schedule. <laughs> Something that is going over very well with my uh, with my girlfriend. It's, it's real great. Oh yeah, and it also goes over great when you forget to upload the solo, and then like our editor's like, "Hey, is Cam gonna send over solo?" I was like, "Uh, yeah." I, it's like I'm asleep until in, four. Ni- in nine hours. <laughs> he might get around. <laughs> he might be awake. He might be awake at four. Yeah, that'd be an early morning. All right. Yeah, it's an early one. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you next week.